Thank you so much for the organizing committee to invite me uh, to give this lecture. And uh, thank you for the chairperson for the nice introduction. Um, today, I'm going to talk uh, about something very important, uh, uh, which is the cross talks between organs. And I'm going to focus on the dialogue and the conversation between kidney and bone. Um, so all the time, our kidney are sending signals and messages to the bone, and also the bone is responding to these messages and signals and uh, sending uh, um, dialogue and uh, um, have a crosstalk with the kidney uh, all the time. And in patients with chronic kidney disease, this dialogue is getting interrupted or uh, distorted. I think I have to say that I don't have anything to disclose. I am a professor at the University of Kentucky. I don't get any uh, money for uh, these talks or for the uh, pharmaceutical industry. And today I'm going to uh, focus on um, uh, understanding the mechanism of bone loss in CKD patient and how to translate and interpret the dialogue that happened between the kidney and the bone and we'll try to acknowledge the importance of bone as a major endocrine organ that communicate all the time with the kidney and the other organ. Then by the end of this lecture, we'll, we are going to focus on the novel bone therapeutic um, medications and targets that has been discovered in the last uh, decade. So this cartoon is an old cartoon. I just intended to show you that this the conversation and the crosstalk between the kidney and the bone is old. As you can see when the nephron uh, loss happened, the uh, primary uh, disorder that can happen is the phosphorus uh, excretion goes down and the activation of the 25 to 125 dihydroxychloroquine calciferol goes down. Of course, this induces hyperparathyroidism, and hyperparathyroidism will send signal to the osteoclast to resolve more bone. And more important, importantly, the PTH will stimulate the FGF23, that is a phosphatoric hormone. So it inhibits the absorption of phosphorus and also further decrease activation of calcitriol. We thought for several decades that the uh, phosphorus excretion is uh, the primary um, disorder that happened in CKD patient, but now we understand that the FGF23 increases a um, long time before um, hyperphosphatemia happened, and this is the main reason that hyperphosphatemia doesn't happen early in the course of CKD, but it's rather a late finding. And this happened because of the compensatory or adaptive mechanism of increased FGF23 early on in the CKD progression. So kidney you know, dysfunction stimulate the uh, BTH and uh, decrease calcitriol both can affect our bone function and health. And at the same time, when you have bone disorder, you know, very good example for that, FGF23 that comes out from the osteocytes in the bone will go up and this will inhibit the renal phosphorus reabsorption. So again, this is a very good example. Not only the kidney talk to the bone, but also the bone talk again to the kidney. So there is a continuous dialogue between kidney and bone. And the result of that is bone remodeling and the bone turnover. We know that we have a lot of growth factor that control osteoclast and osteoblast. And bone resorption and bone formation happens all the time in our body to control the calcium homeostasis and to repair the micro damage and to have normal healthy bone. In our CKD patient, what happened is there is disorder uh, 
osteoblast and osteoclast function. You see this osteoclast, which is a multinucleated giant cell that comes out from the monocyte, it start to secrete acids and enzyme to erode the bone, to eat up the bone. This is called the resorption bit. And this happened quickly actually on the bone surface because it uh, constitute a ruffled border and start to eat the bone just in three to five days, it eats a lot of bone. The one cell, one osteoclast eats bone that need to be replaced by hundreds of osteoclasts. So osteoblast works as soldiers to increase bone formation under several hormones, um, you know, androgen, estrogen, pituitary hormone, thyroid hormone, BTH, and cytokines as well. So it starts to secrete collagen, which is a protein. It's a tough protein. And after this collagen is mineralized, the osteoblast now is entrapped inside the bone, inside the calcified and mineralized bone. The skeleton, it changes over time. So every eight to 10 years, we um, have completely different skeleton. So all of cortical and trabecular bone, it changes over time. Trabecular bone changes over two to three years. Cortical bone takes about eight to 10 years to change. Here, this is a good example of high turnover bone disease that we see commonly in our patients. When you will see a lot of hungry osteoclasts that eat the bone, then the osteoblast comes in to replace the bone. See, this is a multinucleated giant hungry cells that eats the bone very, very quick in case of hyperpara and high turnover bone disease. It starts to secrete acidic environment that dissolve the collagen, then it start to demineralize the bone. The minerals, the calcium, phosphorus will be removed from the bone and go to the circulation. Again, osteoblast will be recruited to replace this bone on a lower rate because the heart and over bone disease, usually the bone resorption exceed, over exceed the bone formation. Here is the collagen that is laid out by the osteoblast. And this is the first step in high turnover bone disease is to start to eat up this protein, which is collagen type one. Osteocytes are the cells that control the osteoclast and the osteoblast function. Because after the osteoblast finishes its action, it gets entrapped inside the bone and it changes to osteocyte. So bone remodeling happens over the time. And the balance between bone formation and bone resorption is very important. And for some reason, in our CKD patients, they lose the balance. So they are either on at either end, either on the high turnover side or low turnover side. And to find the balance in our CKD patient is very, very important. Otherwise, you are going to lose more bone uh, with increased risk of fracture and increase cardiovascular calcification. This happened mainly because of the hyperbara, which started as compensatory mechanism because the PTH is a phosphatoric hormone as also the FGF23, but with increased and the continuous stimulation of BTH, the uh, BTH will increase the uh, turnover and increase bone resorption, and it will change from adaptive to maladaptive process and increase the fragility fracture. Here is the osteocyte. Osteocytes is very important cell, and it's actually an endocrine cell. It's a mechanoreceptor and, and stress sensors. And in our CKD patient, one of the major disorders that happen because they are immobilized, they are less active. So there is reduced load on the bone. So there is an osteocyte dysfunction. And when osteocyte dysfunction happens, the patient will lose the balance between the bone formation 
and bone resorption. So keeping our CKD patient active is very pivotal in their CKD MBD uh, and in their bone and the skeleton health. We know that astronauts, when they go to um, the space, they lose about 10 to 20% of their bone if they stayed in, in the space for a year because there is no gravity. Their bone is not a challenge. But you know, in case of you are doing with bearing exercise or weight lifting, you start to not only build up uh, muscle, but also build up bone. So osteocytes is very important in our uh, conversation between the kidney and the bone. And osteocyte dysfunction happen in our CKD patient. The osteocytes is a mature osteoblast that got trapped inside the mineralized bone. It's the brain cells of the bone. It sends signals and orchestrates the action between osteoblast and osteoclast. When we need more bone formation, it sends the right signal to the osteoblast to increase bone formation. When we need more bone resorption, it sends also the right signal and control the balance for increasing the bone resorption. And if you have more bone resorption, you would have more bone formation. We need bone resorption because it's essential step to have normal or um, physiological calcium and phosphate homeostasis. So it's the brain cells of the bone. It, if we, for, you know, if we use this analogy, if the bone is a bird, and the osteoblast and osteoclast are the two wings. The osteocytes are the brain cells that sign send signals to the wings to speed up or to slow down flying of this bird. Osteocytes are mechanoreceptor and the stress sensors. So osteocyte dysfunction happen in CKD patient, then they start uh, to be because they are inactive, immobilized. So it's very important to encourage them to be active. When they are active, this mechanoreceptor and the stress sensor send the right signals. But if they are less active, they will, this osteocyte will get lazy and have more osteocyte dysfunction. Osteocyte doesn't only have endocrine function. Uh, so it doesn't only secrete uh, hormones and molecules that work remotely, but also uh, sends molecules to work uh, on the adjacent cells. So it has paracrine and also on, on its cells, on cells. So it has autocrine, uh, endocrine, and paracrine dysfunction. So not only the CKD is a state of osteocyte dysfunction, but as you see here, heart disease, liver uh, disease, aging process, postmenopausal osteoporosis, and several other uh, you know, diseases, including uh, tumor metastasis will induce osteocyte dysfunction. As you can see, the shape of the osteocyte, it, it have this elongation because they communicate with each other. They form a network of cells and they send signals and molecules and, and hormones and cytokines all the time to control the bone activity and also to send the signal to the kidney and other organs. So osteocytes is one of the most important cells in our body and osteocyte dysfunction we need to focus on while we are treating our CKD MBD uh, problem. So osteocytes, as we mentioned, is a major uh, endocrine organ. It secretes FGF23, majority of fibroblast growth factor 23 comes out from the uh, osteocyte. It secretes the sclerostin, which uh, inhibit the wink signal. So it inhibits the osteoblast and uh, um, decrease the bone formation because the wink signal is very important in the process of bone formation and osteoblast uh, activation and stimulation. So if you, in case of uh, osteocyte dysfunction, the osteocytes start to secrete more and more FGF23 and more and more sclerostin and both are injurious and uh, harmful in our CKD patients. Also, 
it secretes activin, and activin have um, uh, osteo um, uh, borosis uh, impact and increase bone resorption. It secretes rank L under the effect of the BTH, and it secretes a lot of prostaglandin. So it's very important uh, endocrine function, secretes a lot of molecule that uh, send signal to other organs. FGF23, as we know, is a phosphatoric hormone, comes out mainly from the osteocyte. And when, so if this comes out from the bone and send signal to the kidney, as it increases fibrogenesis, increased tumor necrosis factor alpha, so increased glomerulosclerosis, tubular interstitial uh, disease. It actually also induces left ventricular hypertrophy. And as we know, that higher level of FGF23 is associated with heart disease and with cardiovascular uh, morbidity and mortality. It uh, goes to the liver because also it increases interleukin 6 and uh, uh, CRB from the liver. It uh, deactivates or uh, decreases expression of the calcitriol, so it inhibits the uh, activation uh, of uh, uh, 25 to 125 dihydroxypolycalciferol. It has a lot of uh, uh, you know, harmful effect in our CKT patient. It decreases their immunity. It can uh, have a microbial uh, decrease uh, uh, defense mechanism against uh, uh, micro microbes. So it's, it's very bad. So also, one of the bad molecules that comes out from the bone is the active in E. Active in E uh, comes out from the osteocyte, as we said, and it increases in the CKD vision. Actually, inhibition of active in E have anti-resorbative effect. Here is, this is one of our study. We proved that early on in the course of the kidney disease, even in the CKD stage two, and the early three, the active level goes up and, of course, goes tremendously higher in, in the stage kidney disease vision. It correlates with the bone turnover markers in the bone biopsy. So that's another target to uh, inhibit or, you know, shut down the active receptor to decrease the bone resorption in case of high turnover bone disease. High turnover bone disease and CKD vision happen mainly because of this rank L. So BTH uh, receptor are not on the osteoclast, they are on the surface of osteoblast. So because we, in CKD vision, they have higher BTH. So the BTH goes to the osteoblast surface and activate this molecule, which is osteo, which is the rank L that goes to the osteoclast uh, that has the receptor for the rank L and increase the fusion, maturation, and all stages of osteoclastogenesis. So BTH actually doesn't work uh, directly on the osteoclast, but indirectly through increasing secretion of rank L from the osteoblast and osteocyte. To balance the effect of rank L, uh, also, the osteoblast and osteocyte secretes this OBG, the osteoprotegrin. So osteoprotegrin combine and get adjacent to the rank L. So when they, this uh, complex goes to the receptor, it doesn't identify this molecule, so it doesn't work. In CKD patients, they lose the balance between uh, the rank L and OBG. Usually, if they have high... Uh, BTH to OBG ratio, they will have high term over bone disease. If they have lower B, you know, rank L to OBG ratio, they will have low turnover or a dynamic bone disease. So the balance is very important. It's pivotal in um, the CKD MD process. This is again a case of high turn over bone disease that increase secretion of rank L and increase bone resource. These are all the communications that happen and the molecules and the cytokines and the endocrine function of the bone is just an introduction to what is coming. What is coming is the, the potential therapeutic intervention that can control the bone health 
and cardiovascular disease in our CKD patient. In the last two decades, we have a lot of interventions to improve our um, bone health. We used to have mainly anti-resorbative therapies, but also now we have osteobuilders and bone anabolics. So the major anti-resorbative therapies that we know and we use for several decades are bisphosphonates and the rank uh, L inhibitor, but now we have osteobuilders, you know, medications that increase bone formation like antiscleurosin antibodies, teribaratide, and abalobaratide. So anti-resorptive therapies most uh, widely used is the um, bisphosphonates that increase the osteoclast apoptosis. However, these bisphosphonates accumulate in the bone, especially in CK division, because it's cleared by the kidney. So it can stay in the bone for a long time. So now we are moving from this uh, non-precision medicine and using a medicine that kills the cells or increase cell apoptosis to a smarter way to control the molecule, to control the function rather than the structure of the cell. So now we have the uh, rank L uh, inhibitor, the monoclonal antibody uh, that we, we use, the denozumab to decrease the osteoclastogenesis and uh, use it as anti-resorbative therapy. And it's not retained in patient with CKD, so it's shorter acting and it improve our bone uh, health and decrease the risk of fracture. However, hypocalcemia can happen, so we have to be careful. Again, anti-sclerostin antibody are now also available. We said that sclerostin is a potent inhibitor of bone formation. It inhibits osteoblast. So uh, the soft gene mutation, patients who have this mutation, they have a stronger bone. So the idea was is to have uh, the humanized monoclonal antibody that inhibit sclerostin to increase bone formation. So now we have this romosozumab that was FDA approved to improve the bone health in general in um, patient with osteoporosis. And the major problem with using um, this uh, romosozumab that is humanized monoclonal antibody against uh, the uh, rank, uh, against the sclerostin is that the romosozumab might increase the cardiovascular uh, um, problems, especially cardiovascular calcification, because if you increase bone formation, if you increase mineralization of the skeleton, you might uh, also increase cardiovascular calcification. Uh, there is no single study that examines the effect of romosozumab on cardiovascular calcification in dialysis vision or advanced CKD vision. However, there was a study that came out from Japan uh, four or five months ago and showed that romosozumab is safe in end stage kidney disease patient. They use it for 56 dialysis patient uh, for one year, and it didn't show any signal to increased risk of mortality. However, still we need to examine the effect of the romosozumab, the antiscleurostin antibodies on cardiovascular calcification and the bone and CKD vision. Also now we have FGF23, um, blockers and monoclonal antibody and X-linked hypophosphatemia, they have tremendous amount of uh, uh, FGF23. So they start to dump more phosphorus in their urine, then they start to have hypophosphatemia. In an open label phase two study, borozumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against FGF23, was successful in treating hypophosphatemia in 52 children uh, with excellent hypophosphatemia and active rickets and very weak bone. This was a uh, phase 2b study. So they used two doses either, either uh, every two weeks or every, every four weeks sub-Q injection. As you can see here, the record severity total score was much better when uh, we used the um, FGF23 antibody either on uh, every two weeks or every four weeks. 
here is the serum phosphorus level was much better for patients who received borosumab every four weeks. And this was consistent over time through the whole um, period. So the height of this patient improved, the pain improved, the physical activity and the quality of life improved. So borosum borosumab was very uh, effective uh, in treating this uh, X-linked hypophosphatemia and improving record severity and osteomalacia and the bone health. Again, can we use this borosumab, the anti uh, uh, you know, FGF23 antibody in our dialysis patients still, there is some ongoing trial, but we don't know. Maybe an early CKD patient, it's hard to do this because you are going to block the adaptive mechanism toward um, decreasing the risk of hyperphosphatemia. But what about an end-stage kidney disease patient who have very, very high level of FGF23 uh, that increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Can we use this monoclonal antibody to uh, suppress the cardiovascular uh, disease activity? I mean, there is several study that has been published in the last uh, couple of years about using the borosuzumab, which is anti-FGF23 antibody to improve bone health, not only in children, but in adults, but we are awaiting the um, other trial in CKD patients. So as we mentioned, there is two wings, one to improve the bone formation and the other is to stop the bone resorption. So there is anti-resorbative therapies and there is osteobuilders. The problem with the anti-resorbative therapy, it doesn't build up the bone. So it stop or decrease the rate of bone resorption. However, you still have um, you know, bone that needs to be um, built. So teriparatide, apaloparatide, and the romosuzumab fill this gap because it increased bone formation. It filled this, uh, you know, osteoporosis and weak bone with new, stronger bone. So it increased the bone density, bone quantity and the quality and reduced risk of fracture and CKD patient. So we are not only limited to the uh, anti resorbative therapy, but we also have abalobaratide, teribaratide, and romosuzumab. And both the women, woman, um, abalobaratide significantly uh, improved the BMD and decreased the risk of fracture in this osteoporotic woman. And in post hoc analysis in CKD patients, stage uh, two, three, and four. Abalobaratide was successful also in improving the bone health and uh, correcting the BMD and decrease the risk of low trauma fracture. It's given as 80 um, units subcutaneously once daily into the very umbilical region of the abdomen. Of course, the problem with teriparatide and abalobaratide as there is black box warning to use it for more than two or three years. So we are limited in America. We use it only for two years. In Europe, they use it for three years. So these ejectable drugs can tremendously decrease risk of vertebral fracture. You know that our CKD patients, they might have vertebral fracture, very common. They can fracture one of their spine. Then they start to have chronic back pain. They lose their height. And it's usually atypical symptoms, and usually most of these patients are uh, underdiagnosed. So it's very important to follow the height of our patient and to follow the BMD of our patient and the bone health and to uh, intervene accordingly to prevent bone loss and to improve our uh, dialysis patient, CKD patient's um, quality of life. So the take home message from my presentation today, there is a uh, continuous conversation and dialogue between bone and the kidney. Bone is a major endocrine organ. There is a major discoveries and there is a, a, a lot of novel uh, function and therapeutic target when it comes to uh, bone health and improving our um, bone disease and our CKD patient. We just need to dig more and try to find a resolution and try to uh, find the mechanism of bone loss. First of all, we need to
to find a better way to understand the health of uh, our uh, patient's bone, then if we find that they are losing bone, we have to understand the mechanism. Then we need to use a precision medicine, when to use anti-resorbative therapies, when to use osteo builders to improve our uh, patient's bone health. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, if you have any question or concern, please feel free to contact me at my email, amr.elhosini.moh at uky.edu. And thank you.